Okinawa is over. Japan has lost the war, but they have not surrendered. Early in the morning, Japanese communications receive a series of conditions for their surrender to the Allies. This is known as the Potsdam Proclamation, which concludes with the following. We call upon the government of Japan to proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces and to provide proper and adequate assurances of their good faith in such action. The alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. Prime Minister Suzuki decided for the newspapers to release only a controlled portion of the text. War Minister General Anami wanted to release a strong statement against the declaration, but Suzuki decided to ignore the matter for now. His official statement was essentially to kill it with silence. I consider the joint proclamation a rehash of the declaration at the Cairo conference. As for the government, it does not attach any important value to it at all. The only thing to do is just kill it with silence. We will do nothing but press on to the bitter end to bring about a successful completion of the war. The Suzuki government is one that is extremely split. There are essentially two factions. You have those who were really looking into surrendering, which was Prime Minister Suzuki, Foreign Minister Togo, and the Minister of the Navy, uh, Admiral Yanai. And then there were those who really wanted to keep fighting. And they were led by Minister of the Army, General Anami, and his staff within the War Ministry. On August 6, 1945, Hiroshima was bombed. At 8 o'clock in the morning, a B-29 was spotted flying over Hiroshima. Around 90,000 died in an instant by a blast brighter than a thousand suns. Japan does not respond. August 9th, 1945, Nagasaki is bombed. At 11 o'clock a.m., the second atomic bomb is dropped on Nagasaki. Around 40,000 are killed instantly. That same day, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan. Manchuria is invaded with lightning speed, and the Soviets seem unstoppable. The Suzuki cabinet falls into deadlock once again. Suzuki, Togo, and Yonai favor accepting the Allied ultimatum. Anami and the Army and Navy Chiefs of Staff do not believe Japan was defeated yet. Our army will not submit to demobilization said Anami. We must fight the war through to the end, no matter how great the odds against us. Suzuki and Togo only had one option left to break the stalemate, and that was approach the Emperor. The Emperor, after many meetings with Prime Minister Suzuki, agrees to open negotiations to terminate the war. Japan sends the following notice to the Allies. The Japanese government are ready to accept the terms enumerated in the joint declarations which were issued at Potsdam on July 26, 1945, by the heads of the government of the United States, Great Britain, and China, and the later subscribed to by the Soviet government, with the understanding that said declaration does not compromise any demand which prejudices the prerogatives of His Majesty as the sovereign ruler. Previously, the Allies had explained to the Japanese that they would essentially be under control of a supreme Allied commander if they were to surrender, and this creates tension in the cabinet. Suzuki, Yonai, and Togo wish to just continue surrendering. There's just no hope. However, Anami and his staff, they downright refuse. The Emperor must remain in power. The stalemate continues. At 10.30 a.m. on a hot and humid day, the cabinet meets with the Emperor for a final decision on Japan's future. Suzuki reported their position to accept the terms of surrender, and Anami presented the opposition to that surrender. The entire room bursts into tears. Emperor Hirohito makes the decision to surrender. I have listened carefully to each of the arguments presented in opposition to the view that Japan should accept the Allied reply as it stands and without further clarification or modification, but my own thoughts have not undergone any change. In order that the people may know my decision, I request you to prepare at once an imperial rescript so that I may broadcast to the nation. Finally, I call upon each and every one of you to exert himself to the utmost 
so that we may meet the trying days which lie ahead. Thus begins Japan's longest day. General Nami arrives at the Ministry of War, where men gather wanting to know what has happened. The Emperor said he was confident our nation's structure will be preserved. We have no choice but to abide by his decision. It is based on his confidence in our loyalty, says Anami. In the midst of these grieving soldiers was Lieutenant Colonel Matsutaka Aida and Major Kenji Hatanaka. Only Hatanaka's sobs can be heard in the room. Brewing concerns of an upcoming coup begin to fester throughout the Japanese government. Lieutenant General Takashi Mori of the Imperial Guard greatly feared the Eastern District Army and their reactions to the surrender. Word traveled fast that several young officers were already calling for an uprising to continue the war. A cabinet meeting is held to discuss the wording of the Emperor's speech. It was presumptuous to ask the emperor to broadcast directly to the people, so the decision is made that it should be recorded, and his broadcast would then be played the following day. NHK Radio is told they are going to handle the imperial broadcast. The director of domestic bureau is Kenjiro Yabe, who relays the information. The Japanese people had never before heard the emperor speak, so this was without a doubt an important event. The pressure was on NHK. All the while, Major Hatanaka, while controlling his emotion, begins to plot. He's described as a man of great charm, who was vigorous and full of life, but on August 14th, he would prove to be dangerous. He was left alone by his fellow officers once Anami left, which was a huge mistake. At this moment, after collecting himself, Hatanaka made the most crucial decision of his life. Lieutenant Colonel Ida sat alone in a chair. He contemplated the hypocrisy of the situation. Japan would rather die than surrender, and yet here they were surrendering. He did not blame the emperor, but the hypocrisy of the government bent on saving themselves. The war ministry issues a statement, in that its defeat does not mean total destruction, but a civil war would. And the only way to save Japan now was to adhere to imperial command. An hour has passed, and the cabinet is still meeting about the language of Hirohito's manuscripts. Yanai promises the good behavior of the navy, and I speak for the army, says Anami. Both men had a chance to officially put down the young officer speaking of rebellion at this moment, but found it unnecessary, as it might burden the emperor. The heads of the NHK Broadcasting Building are warned to keep the sessions a secret, even from their own staff, in case of an uprising. However, most of the NHK staff understood what was happening by the expressions on their fellow workers. They saw true emotion, and they knew that Japan was going to surrender. Two K-Type 14 recorders were set, and a single Matsuda A-Type microphone was erected in preparations for the Emperor's arrival. Major Hatanaka meets with Lieutenant Colonel Shizaki at the Imperial Guards Division HQ. They spoke to Major Ishihara and Major Kaga, who was the son-in-law of General Tojo. Many officers had by now told Hatanaka to stand down and accept the Emperor's decision, but he has refused. Hatanaka believes the men around the Emperor, they had deceived him, and they had pressured the Emperor into accepting the Potsdam ultimatum. Therefore, the Emperor did not truly want surrender. It is the duty of the Imperial Guards to protect the Emperor from these people. With that in mind, they begin to formulate a plan. Meanwhile, Anami agrees to sign a document, making it clear the stances of the War Ministry to all of their soldiers. Issued August 14th, 2.40 p.m., the Imperial forces will act strictly in accordance with the decision of His Imperial Majesty the Emperor. Hatanaka rides to speak with General Tanaka, who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Eastern District Army. Tanaka immediately shoots Hatanaka down, before Hatanaka can even speak. I know what's on your mind. I don't want to hear it. Leave at once. Get out. At the War Ministry, documents begin to be burned around this time. 
Watching over it is Lieutenant Colonel Ida as he contemplates his own suicide. Hatanaka, using a bike, goes to see Ida. Ida is preparing for his own suicide when Hatanaka enters. They went to the military academy together, so they knew each other fairly well and considered each other friends. Hatanaka asks Ida, what should be done? To which Ida explains, seppuku. They should kill themselves honorably. Hatanaka finds this prospect a good one, a favorable one, an honorable one, but he nevertheless explains his coup idea to Ida. This meeting is full of confusion and self-doubt, and, and perhaps if done at a different time or even with somebody else, someone probably could have talked down Hatanaka here. But Ida does not. Ida ultimately refuses to join the coup, mainly due to the War Ministry's proclamation signed earlier. Meanwhile, three Imperial Guard divisions, which were assigned to guard the Emperor, have increased in numbers dramatically, which begins to arouse suspicion. The NHK engineers have since moved to the Imperial Palace and have been waiting for hours. General Nami is the one holding them up. The cabinet is still in a deadlock after hours. There is a single statement in the Emperor's rescript that he does not like, and it reads, The war situation grows more unfavorable to us every day. This would render all of Japan's propaganda as utter lies which they were. Anami still insists Japan has not lost the war, and that, quote, the situation is merely not turned into our favor. Admiral Yanai grows immediately hostile towards the notion, and he cites the horrific losses at Okinawa and, and Burma and Iwo Jima and Saipan, and the list goes on and on. But Anami sees this as a chance for Japan to continue the war, that these high casualties are why the war must continue. He does not budge and offers the alternative statement. The war situation has not turned in our favor. Yanai and the other ministers balk at the notion when Yanai is summoned to the Navy Ministry. He gets a break and walks out of the room. Meanwhile, the NHK members at the Imperial Palace are now told to be prepared to record the Emperor at 7 o'clock p.m. At around 6 o'clock p.m., Yonai returns much calmer than he was earlier. He pulls Prime Minister Suzuki aside and say that they should revise the rescript to what Anami wants. Suzuki doesn't believe it at first. Yonai and Anami are arch enemies after all, but Yonai reassures Suzuki of his position. Anami had used this brief break to return to his residence and change into a fresh pair of clothing. In the meantime, he received General Hideki Tojo. Tojo speaks to Anami about being tried by the Allies as war criminals, and Tojo speaks about a defensive war for the greater East Asia. It shows a lack of adherence to the reality that Japan was, in fact, the aggressor in the whole situation. To these militarists, they acted only in defense of their homes, which just wasn't true. They had become radicalized by their own propaganda. When Anami returned to the cabinet, they agreed upon the rescript for the Emperor. Copies were then printed and presented to the Imperial Palace. Finally, some momentum as the coup plot thickened. Now they needed to decide what time to best broadcast the message. Togo proposed 7 o'clock a.m. on August 15th, and Yanai seconded. This was to announce the surrender as soon as possible to avoid further damage to the Japanese people and also in case of the outbreak of violence. However, Anami disagreed, and he wanted the broadcast to also be issued overseas, all of it simultaneously, and he promised that all Japanese military commanders overseas understand what is happening, to understand that Japan was in fact surrendering. 12 o'clock p.m. on August 15th is the time that they agree to. Hirohito finally receives a copy of the transcript for his speech. He agrees to it and signs it with his official decree. The 14th day of the 8th month of the 12th year of Showa. Hatanaka realizes how little time they have left to enact their coup. The conspirators know that there will be no chance of success if the broadcast is given, so they must act immediately. 
Since 5 o'clock p.m., they have been compiling a list of guard officers. General Mori remains with a question mark next to his name. Will he join or will he not? Mori is an integral part of this entire operation. Once they have his cooperation, the other officers of the Eastern District Army and the Imperial Guards will follow suit. They also defined what they wanted to replace the current government with, and that was a military-run restoration of what Japan had once and would have again. The conspirators then rode out towards their intended targets, with set objectives in mind, and the coup had officially begun. By this time, General Inami had returned to the War Ministry. He decides it's time to write a letter of resignation, and he puts it in his pocket. To Inami, his work was almost complete, but he had some business to attend to before this night was over. Hatanaka arrives to see Colonel Haga, a division commander of the 2nd Regiment. Hatanaka speaks at length about their plot and their motives. Their goal is to best isolate the Emperor at the palace, where he would be persuaded against surrendering. Once the Emperor changed his mind, the army would thus follow suit. Haga was no fool, and he asserts that it works both ways. If the Emperor decides it's time to surrender, the army will follow the Emperor. This backs Hatanaka into a corner. Hatanaka decides to lie and explain that Anami, the Army Chief of Staff, and two commanders of the Eastern District Army and the Imperial Guards Divisions were on board with the coup. Shizaki backs Hatanaka up and continues the lie. Haga still refuses, but it convinced Hatanaka and Shizaki that their next course of action needed to be getting General Mori on their side. He would provide the clout they needed to carry out their coup. They continue to spout their lies to Colonel Haga, and he actually begins to buy their story, though he remains reserved and contemplative. As the time approached 10 o'clock p.m., the cabinet reformed. Together, they all began signing the official rescript, the first being Prime Minister Suzuki. This was the official act of the Japanese government and that they were going to adhere to the emperor's wishes. Lieutenant Colonel Ida was asleep at the War Ministry when awakened by Hatanaka. Hatanaka and Shizaki now formally asked Ida to join the coup. This time, they have some backing with Colonel Haga and the Imperial Guard. Ida knows that without General Mori, the coup is doomed to failure, which is why the conspirators want Ida. Ida is actually somewhat close with General Mori, as he was one of Ida's teachers. He would be a friendly face to help persuade General Mori to join the coup. It is known by this point that something is amiss within the Imperial Palace. Yet, no military officer did anything active to try to stop these conspirators from plotting and achieving their goals. Hatanaka understood this fact and interpreted it as they secretly wanted him to succeed, which was just more self-delusion. Ida pleads with Hatanaka that the situation is utterly hopeless and that he needs to give up now before he gets too deep into this. But Hatanaka and Shizaki cannot accept this. They are the epitome of years of Japanese propaganda and lies that have done to what would otherwise have been probably very decent human beings. Ida reluctantly decides to go along with Hatanaka and Shizaki and ride away on their bikes to the Imperial Guards Division headquarters. The cabinet has finally been dismissed. General Anami wears his best uniform and approaches the exhausted Prime Minister Suzuki. Anami decides to apologize to Suzuki formally for creating the delays early in the day, to which Suzuki accepts. Anami then takes out a wrapped up newspaper and hands it to Suzuki. Inside are Anami's cigars gathered from his adventures in the South. Suzuki accepts the gifts and Anami leaves for his residence. Suzuki is heard to have said, I think the war minister came to say goodbye. The room fell back into silence. The NHK engineers are startled after waiting for hours on end to see the Emperor arrive. The Emperor fixes his white gloves, and he asks, How loudly should I speak? The engineer replies that his normal tone should suffice. 
This turned out to be an issue, as the Emperor was extremely soft-spoken. Many of these engineers had never once seen the Emperor in person, let alone heard his voice. The engineers begin recording, and the Emperor approaches the microphone and begins to speak. Lieutenant Colonel Ida is meeting with fellow conspirator Major Kaga at General Mori's headquarters. General Mori remains in conference and cannot be disturbed. Every second that passes is a second in favor of the cabinet and the emperor's resolution. So while they wait, the other conspirators begin studying the plans hastily written by Hatanaka himself. Since arriving at General Mori's HQ, the conspirators have learned that most of the division's battalion commanders had not only agreed to Hatanaka's plan, but have already begun stationing troops in strategic positions around the palace and ready for a strike. In a fit of impatience and excitement, Hatanaka storms off not wishing to remain still. The Emperor's first recording proves to be too low. His voice was too quiet. It is decided to do a second take of the Emperor's speech, and the Chamberlains watch the clocks tick by. Captain Takio Sasaki of the Yokohama Guards is hurriedly moving towards their headquarters. Currently, there is one battalion stationed at one of the Sojiji temples. Sasaki plans to arm this battalion, then march to the cabinet building and kill Prime Minister Suzuki. Captain Sasaki was not aware of Hatanaka's conspiracy, nor were either revolt aware of the Atsugi Air Base, which was also currently planning their own revolt. The only thing consistent about all these revolts is that they could hear shouts of Banzai off in the distance. The Emperor has returned to the Imperial Palace unaware of the conspiracies growing around him. The NHK engineers created two sets of records containing the Emperor's speech. They are placed into two khaki-colored cotton bags. As rumors continue to grow of the coming coup d'etat, it is agreed that the records would be safest in the Imperial Household Ministry. The records are then carried to an office used by members of the Empress's retinue. They find a small safe in this office and decide to place the records here until morning. For now, the Imperial records were secure. Captain Sasaki's attempt to mobilize a revolt proved difficult. All four battalion commanders have outright refused Sasaki's call for emergency mobilization. Sasaki, in a rage, exclaims, Don't try to stop me if you know what's good for you. The captain has no intentions of surrendering. General Mori finally agrees to meet with the conspirators. Hatanaka has yet to return, leaving Ida and Shizaki to convince Mori of their intentions. But Mori knows why they are here and refuses to back the coup attempt. Mori begins to talk calmly for several minutes, not allowing Ida or Shizaki to speak. Hatanaka is busy speaking with Lieutenant Colonel Takashida. Hatanaka speaks bluntly of their plans to overthrow the cabinet. However, Takashida believes the coup will fail. He asserts to Hatanaka that General Anami will not back the coup, but Hatanaka is nevertheless unfazed. He will once we take power, shouts Hatanaka, as he realizes what time it is. Hatanaka leaves Takashida to think about their position, but Takashida agrees to go speak to General Anami. General Mori continues to lecture Aida and Shizaki and explains he wishes to pray to the Meiji Shrine. Aida resigns himself that the attempted coup has failed with Mori's support gone. However, Hatanaka has returned. Aida gives a smile to Hatanaka, which is misinterpreted as meaning Mori has actually agreed to join their efforts. Sometime after Hatanaka entered General Mori's office, a gunshot is heard. Horrified, Ida runs back into the office, and he can hear the agonizing moans of General Mori. Hatanaka appears with a pistol in his hand and a look of horror on his face. He had just shot General Mori, and Hatanaka begins to panic. Ida can also see Uehara, another conspirator, wiping blood from his sword. General Mori lays on the ground motionless with a gunshot wound. Beside him is the decapitated body of Mori's brother-in-law. Blood covered the walls, forcing Ida to turn away. He manages to look at Hatanaka, who locks eyes with him, but neither men say a word to each other. 
The death of General Mori forced the conspirators to advance their plans. Here, Ida decides that the coup was over before it began. If Mori's murder was discovered, the army would never back the conspirators. Hatanaka is momentarily phased by all this, but pulls himself together. He approaches General Mori's desk. Here he finds Mori's seal and stamps it onto several copies of their plan. Hatanaka then reads their plan aloud, dubbed Imperial Guards Division Strategic Order No. 584. 1. The division will defeat the enemy scheme. It will protect the Emperor and preserve the national polity. 2. The commander of the 1st Infantry Regiment will occupy the East 2nd and East 3rd Garrison grounds, including the surroundings of the Eastern District Army Strategy Room and the environs of the Hanmaru Baba, thus guarding the Imperial family against this sector. The commander will also order a company to occupy Tokyo Broadcast Station and prohibit all broadcasts. 3. The commander of the 2nd Infantry Regiment will use his main force to guard the Imperial family at the Fukiich district of the Imperial Palace. 4. The commanders of the 6th Infantry Regiment will continue present duties. 5. The commander of the 7th Infantry Regiment will occupy the area of Ninjubashi Gate and prevent any contact with the Imperial Palace. 6. The commander of the Cavalry Regiment will order a tank force to Daikon Avenue and await further orders. Seven. The commander of the 1st Artillery Regiment will await further orders. 8. The commander of the 1st Engineers will await for further orders. 9. The commander of the Mechanized Battalion will guard the Imperial Palace at its present strength. 10. The commanders of the Signal Unit will sever all communications with the Imperial Palace except through Division Headquarters. 11. I shall be at Division Headquarters. Within the hour, the Imperial Palace was controlled by the insurgent Imperial Guards. As ordered, the police were disarmed, the ground surrounded, and the entrances blocked. The move was so quick and effective that not one member of the Imperial Household Ministry yet knew the Emperor was now in the hands of the conspirators. General Anami sits quietly at his residence. He has just finished writing two poems directed towards the Emperor. After tasting the profound benevolence of the Emperor, I have no words to speak. The next poem reads, For my supreme crime, I beg forgiveness through the act of death. Staring at the papers for a long while, Anami decides to write one last line. I believe in Japan's sacred indestructibility. Meanwhile, the 1st Infantry Regiment receives Strategic Order No. 584 by Major Kaga. Not knowing of General Mori's murder, the troops begin to move to implement the conspirators' plans. Major Hatanaka is frantically moving. He knows full well that the entire plan now rests on two conversations he needs to have. The first is between General Tanaka and Colonel Ida. The second and more important conversation needed to be between General Anami and his brother-in-law Takashida. Takashida has learned of Hatanaka's plan, and he relays the information to General Anami. To his surprise, Anami is enjoying some sake. He's enjoying himself. He nevertheless relays Hatanaka's plans to occupy the palace, and then try to get the army to revolt and carry on the war. Anami sits and says, The Eastern Army District will never join the revolt. Anami then returns to drinking, his decision to die resolute. Lieutenant Colonel Ida has returned to speak with Hatanaka. Ida has learned that the Eastern Army, as Anami warned, would not join their conspiracy. But Hatanaka is not phased. Instead, Hatanaka becomes even more resolute. Several of his acts have already been successfully carried out. There has been very little violence. The palace was occupied. They had cut the communication wires and closed off all the entrances to the palace. Things were going very smoothly. Ida decides to leave, having nothing left to say, but Hatanaka formulates a fallback plan. Not trusting the commitment of the Eastern Army, Hatanaka, Major Kaga, and Shizaki decided best to search every room of the Imperial Palace. They would need to find the Emperor's recordings and destroy the records. This would gain them further time to consolidate their advantage. But they needed to find where they were soon. The clock was continuing to tick. While Hatanaka decided to find the Imperial records, the decision is made in the Imperial Palace to move the recordings to a safer location. By now, they had discovered what was going on. 
the Imperial Palace is full of hidden rooms and secret corridors. Those inside decide to use this to their advantage. After moving a cupboard to reveal a hidden passageway, the recording protectors see a bank vault at the end of a long, thin hallway. They decide to hide the Imperial recordings in there. Major Kaga speaks with the Bureau Director of NHK, the radio station that will transmit the Emperor's message. The Director informs Kaga that the recordings are in the Imperial Household Ministry, and that the broadcast will be made at 12 o'clock p.m. that day from their station. Now the conspirators know two important factors. One, the recordings are half in their possession already, and two, they have until noon to find and destroy those recordings. With this, the Imperial Guards fix bayonets and load the rifles. Once the rifles were loaded, the order was given, and the Imperial Guards stormed the Ministry. They needed to find those recordings. At Eastern Army Headquarters, Guard Commanders begin reporting in as ordered. Here, they receive the following orders. 1. The commander of the 1st Imperial Guards Division, General Mori, has been killed by insubordinate officers. 2. The 1st Imperial Guards Division will, until further order, be under the direct command of the commander of the Eastern District Army. 3. The 1st Imperial Guard Division's orders issued as of today's date are false. They are hereby cancelled. 4. All troops surrounding the Imperial Palace are ordered to disperse. The search for the recordings continues, but things are proving more difficult than anticipated. It is by chance the recordings were kept in the Imperial Household Ministry. The building is a labyrinth of small, narrow rooms that are they all look identical. And each room is labeled with an old-fashioned name that is utterly unrecognizable to the soldiers trying to search them. And the soldiers had no clue which rooms were used and which rooms were not, forcing them to literally search everywhere. Many buildings around the Ministry were three stories tall. The Chamberlain Palace was built directly into a hill. If somebody entered in the front, they'd be entering on the first floor, but if somebody came in from the rear, they'd come in on the third floor. On top of this confusion, a blackout was ordered as American B-29 bombers were seen approaching from the sea. Many of the conspirators knew almost immediately that they needed to move faster, and force might need to be used to find those Imperial recordings. General Anami decides that it's time for him to grab two of his ancient daggers. They had been passed down in his family from generation to generation. He keeps the shorter blade and hands the other one to Takashida. The search for the Imperial recordings was growing violent as the time approached 4 o'clock a.m. The Ministry personnel decided it best to wear all the same clothing to help further the confusion. The only distinction were the number of stars or stripes depending on their position. It became clear that soldiers had no clue who was who. Many personnel began giving deliberately false information to the soldiers to further slow them down. Others openly contradicted each other to continue the disruption. They were willing to do anything to slow these soldiers down to keep them from those Imperial recordings. Hatanaka had sent a request to speak to General Nami close to an hour ago. He has received no word back. The Imperial recordings had also failed to show up things were not looking good for the conspirators. They also learned that General Tanaka had publicly spoken out against the coup and was in the process of trying to stop it. Colonel Haga of the 2nd Infantry Regiment had heard the rumors and was now beginning to have doubts as to the orders he had received. Haga storms into the Imperial Guards Division headquarters and begins to shout. He demands to know why General Anami has not arrived. He was told the War Minister was backing the conspiracy. Hatanaka decides to buy some time to telephone Anami's residence himself. However, Major Kaga grew impatient. He informs Colonel Haga that General Mori is dead. Colonel Haga would not budge until he knew how General Mori died, and the conspirators had nothing to respond with. At this time, Colonel Takashida officially decides to abandon Hatanaka's plot in favor of being with General Anami for his last moments alive. The time was just turning 4 o'clock in the morning. 37 men were speeding towards Tokyo from Yokohama. Most of them were boys full of hatred and fire. Armed with pistols, swords, and machine guns, they were led by Captain Sasaki. His fiery speech rallied these young men to join 
his cause. Captain Sasaki's hatred was aimed directly at Prime Minister Suzuki. To Sasaki, Suzuki was the arch enemy of Japan, and he must be killed. Their immediate objective is the Prime Minister's official residence. Suzuki's assassination will be the first step in the elimination of the entire cabinet, thus liberating Japan from these traitors. With any luck, the cabinet will still be in session. Lieutenant Colonel Ida pulls up to the front of the War Minister's residence. Takashita allows Ida to enter and takes him to see General Anami. Ida is taken aback by seeing Anami ready for seppuku. Ida also wishes to end his life in an honorable way, but Anami specifically tells Ida not to. You must do your best to help rebuild Japan. That takes more courage than dying. Anami then invites Ida to drink some sake with them, and Ida accepts. Hatanaka receives a telephone call from Chief of Staff Takashima. Hatanaka tries to explain their situation, but Takashima interrupts him. Takashima, like the others, explains that Hatanaka's position is hopeless, and they must end the revolt immediately. Hatanaka then decides to ask to speak directly to the people for 10 minutes before the Emperor's broadcast. This was a fallback option for their unraveling coup d'etat. Takashima will not have this. He explains their deaths will be meaningless, to which Hatanaka will not accept. When Takashima hangs up, Colonel Haga storms into their office. He finally pieced together what the conspirators have been doing. He knows they've lied to him. General Anami will never arrive. Haga severs his ties to the conspirators and brands them traitors. He now demands Major Hatanaka to leave the Imperial Palace at once. Hatanaka will not budge. The sun began to rise in the distance. Only a faint shade of blue can be seen on the horizon. Captain Sasaki's forces have arrived at the Prime Minister's official residence. They parked and quietly made their way forward. The two light machine guns are placed by the residence entrance. The troops are now in position, and Sasaki gives the order to fire. Suzuki's staff members awake to bullets flying all around them, the windows being smashed and the walls filling with bullet holes. Several manage to escape through an underground corridor Sasaki is blissfully unaware of. He gives the order to charge, and his troops storm the residency, demanding entrance. A lone guard greets them, and he explains to Sasaki he is on their side, which is a lie. Sasaki believes the guard, and the men pour oil onto the residency carpet. It fails to light, greatly aggravating Suzaki and the others. After wasting precious time, the oil finally caught fire, and the residency exploded into flames. But as Suzaki left, staff members rushed back to this residency and managed to douse the fire. But they had no idea where Suzaki was off to next. Only a mile away, soldiers of the 1st Regiment of the Imperial Guards surround the NHK building where the broadcast is supposed to take place. Several demand the broadcast be cancelled and begin messing with the equipment. They lock around 60 NHK staff members into Studio One to keep them isolated. The search for the Imperial recordings was still underway at the Imperial Palace. They still had no luck finding these recordings. All the while, the sun continued to rise in the distance, and a conspirator's time was running out. Major Hatanaka arrives at the Japanese Broadcast Corporation. He marches directly to Studio 2, where Mario Tatano and the announcer waited. Hatanaka demands he put his case before the Japanese people. He wishes to speak before the Emperor's broadcast. Tatano decides to stall, knowing that the 5 o'clock a.m. news was just starting, and Hatanaka's broadcast would just interrupt it. Hatanaka makes his demands again, but Tateno is firm in not allowing him to make the broadcast. In a bit of rage, Hatanaka pulls out his pistol and points it directly at Tateno's head. Tateno swallows with sweat beating down his face, but he stares Hatanaka down. General Tanaka from the Eastern District Army arrives at Guard's headquarters. Tanaka finds General Mori's corpse still on the ground. He orders those inside the headquarters arrested, including Ishihara, an important conspiracy member. Ishihara says nothing, neither admitting nor accepting his guilt. Tanaka then gets to a telephone and places a call to the Imperial Palace. Colonel Haga picks up on the other end, and Tanaka orders him to meet at the Anui Gate. 
Hajime Suzuki receives a telephone call warning about Captain Sasaki. They had failed to burn down the official residence and were now on their way to the Prime Minister's personal residence. Hajime grabs his mother and they get into an official car. The car refused to start and around 10 guards helped push it up a hill. They notice several vehicles approaching from the highway and the Suzuki's hide in the back seat. Captain Sasaki and his men approach in full speed and rush right past the Suzuki car. In his rush, he fails to notice the Suzuki family, and they continue onward to their personal residence. The Suzuki family is safe for now, and they drive off into the distance. Captain Sasaki arrives at the Suzuki personal residence. He is greeted by the Prime Minister's grandson and Miss Yuriko Hara. Suzaki pulls out his sword and places it to her chest. He demands to speak to the Prime Minister. Suzuki is not there, however, which enrages Captain Suzaki. He turns to his men and orders the place searched. After a while, the soldiers report that Suzuki is not in the residence. Disgusted, Suzaki orders the house burned. Unlike the official residency, Suzuki's house becomes a conflagration. Sasaki orders his men to their next objective, leaving Suzuki's grandson and Miss Hara to watch their house burn to the ground. General Anami draws his sword as Takashita and Ida watch. He is on his knees. With a final inhale, he stabs himself in the gut. Takashita drops to his knees as he watches Anami pull the sword across his belly, blood seeping over his hands and across his lap onto the floor. The blood falls onto his letter to the Emperor. With one hand, Anami reaches up and touches his neck. He searches for the corroded artery. As Anami begins to sway from the pain and blood loss, he swipes his knife across his neck, and the blood pulsates outwards. Yet he still remained upright, Takashita and Ida watching in horror. Shall I help you? asked Takashita. No, answered Anami. Leave me. With those words, Takashita stood, and he stepped outside into Anami's garden. Anami remained upright. At Anui Gate, General Tanaka confers with Colonel Haga. Haga admits Division Order Number 584 was a forgery. Tanaka just orders Haga back to his men and to return to their original stations. Haga complies. The revolt is all but over. Major Hatanaka still has his pistol drawn on Tatano. However, he can see the situation is falling apart around him. He goes on a tirade defending his position, the evils of the cabinet, and how the cabinet had polluted the emperor into surrendering. It falls on deaf ears, the guards growing uneasy. The telephone rings and Hatanaka lowers his pistol and answers. Tatano breathes a sigh of relief. On the other end is an officer of the Eastern District Army. The coup has failed. Hatanaka has failed. After hanging up, all the fire inside Hatanaka vanished. He looked at the guards, sighed, and ordered everyone to leave. With that, the conspirators left NHK, and the radio station was free to resume preparations to broadcast the Emperor's speech. Lieutenant Colonel Shizake is still at the Imperial Palace. He learns of General Tanaka and the Eastern District Army seizing the guards' office. In a fit of rage, Shizaki drew his sword and hit the closest pine tree. Bark flew in every direction. Shizaki now realizes he has failed. Captain Shizaki and his men arrive at Baron Haranuma's house. They are unaware if anyone is inside or not, and Shizaki immediately orders the place burned to the ground. His radical soldiers obey. And after watching the building be engulfed in flames, Sasaki orders his men back to the vehicles and to their next objective. Anami's body remains still, his form upright, head slumped, blood still dripping from his wounds. Takashida has returned and asks Anami a question, but there is no answer. Anami has fallen unconscious. He approaches his uncle, then jabs a dagger into Anami's neck to finish the job and allow Anami to die with honor. He then calls Anami's wife and sister to inform them of his death. Then he returns, staring at Anami's lifeless body. He blames himself for failing Anami, the Emperor, and Japan.
Prime Minister Suzuki awakes. He sees his son entering safe from Captain Suzaki and his men. The Inspector General of the Tokyo Police enters and informs Suzuki that General Anami is dead and that soldiers have occupied the Imperial Palace. This is the first Suzuki hears about the extent of Hatanaka's coup. At 7.21 a.m., a special bulletin is heard over NHK radio. His Imperial Majesty the Emperor has issued a rescript. It will be broadcast at noon today. Let us all respectfully listen to the voice of the Emperor at noon today. 8 o'clock a.m. each morning marks the changing of the guard. General Tanaka watches intently as the soldiers change from one shift to the other without any problems. He is relieved. He receives notice that Major Hatanaka is still at the NHK building. He orders Hatanaka placed under guard immediately. Under no circumstances is Hatanaka to be allowed to speak to the people. Inside the Imperial Palace, the recordings are removed from the vault. They had survived the night without being found. Now they need to be taken to the NHK building for broadcast. Lieutenant Colonel Ida receives a disturbing report that two officers had begun distributing leaflets to the people of Tokyo. One of them stole a horse, the other a motorcycle. Hatanaka has reached his final desperate attempt to justify his actions throughout the night. Behind the war ministry, thick black clouds of smoke can be seen. The burning of classified documents had resumed since the previous day. The smoke blotted out the sun. The Imperial recordings reach the NHK building without any issues. The engineers prepare the recording for broadcast and wait for the clocks to strike noon. Major Hatanaka and Lieutenant Colonel Shizaki ride up and down the streets shouting to the top of their lungs. They throw and cast leaflets exclaiming a desire to continue the war. People look at them as if they are insane. We officers of the Imperial Japanese Army, who this morning, August 15th, 1945, have risen up in arms, declare to all officers and soldiers of the armed forces and to the Japanese people that our intention is to protect the Emperor and to preserve the national polity despite the designs of the enemy. That our prime concern is neither victory nor defeat, nor are we motivated by selfish interest. That we are ready to live or die for the sole, just, and righteous cause of national loyalty, and that we devoutly pray that the Japanese people and the members of the armed forces will appreciate the significance of our action and join with us to fight for the preservation of our country and the elimination of the traitors around the Emperor, thus confounding the schemes of the enemy. Everyone in the NHK building is on edge with less than half an hour before the broadcast begins. Lieutenant Colonel Shigatoyo Suzuki watches his men carefully, and he notices one man standing outside Studio 8. He asks the soldier what is the matter, but the man moves quickly. The soldier draws his sword. There will not be any broadcast. I'm going to kill them all, he shouts. Other soldiers grab the rebel and suppress him. He drops his sword. Suzuki then turns the soldier over to the Kempe Tai. The NHK staff watch the fight unfold terrified that any of these soldiers might rebel and possibly kill them. Shizaki falls to the ground, his sword through his stomach. He has taken the final steps to properly honor the Emperor. Hatanaka cocks his pistol, hands trembling, and places the barrel to his forehead. He pulls the trigger, the back of his head exploding, and he falls to the ground in a lifeless heap. The broadcast lights turn on at the NHK station. The announcer prepares to introduce the Emperor's speech. A broadcast of the highest important is about to be made. All listeners will please rise. An entire nation rose to their feet at that moment and awaited their Emperor's voice. His Majesty the Emperor will now read his Imperial Rescript to the people of Japan. We respectfully transmit his voice. The Japanese national anthem begins to play. Many begin to cry. Others remain emotionless. The Emperor's speech begins. To our good and loyal subjects, after pondering deeply the general trends of the world and the actual conditions obtaining in our empire today, 
we have decided to effect a settlement of the present situation by resorting to an extraordinary measure. We have ordered our government to communicate to the governments of the United States, Great Britain, China, and the Soviet Union that our empire accepts the provisions of their joint declaration to strive for the common prosperity and happiness of all nations, as well as the security and the well-being of our subjects, is the solemn obligation which has been handed down by our imperial ancestors and which lies close to our heart. Indeed, we declared war on America and Britain out of our sincere desire to ensure Japan's self-preservation and the stabilization of East Asia, it being far from our thought either to infringe upon the sovereignty of other nations or to embark upon territorial aggrandizement. But now the war has lasted for nearly four years. Despite the best that has been done by everyone, the gallant fighting of the military and naval forces, the diligence and assiduity of our servants of the state, and the devoted service of our 100 million people, the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage, while the general trends of the world have all turned against their interest. Moreover, the enemy has begun to employ a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is, indeed, incalculable, taking the toll of many innocent lives. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. Such being the case, how are we to save the millions of our subjects or to atone ourselves before the hallowed spirits of our imperial ancestors? This is the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the provisions of the joint declaration of the powers. We cannot but express the deepest sense of regret to our allied nations of East Asia, who have consistently cooperated with the empire towards the emancipation of East Asia. The thought of those officers and men, as well as others who have fallen in the fields of battle, those who died at their posts of duty, or those who met with untimely death, and all their bereaved families, pains our heart night and day. The welfare of the wounded and the war sufferers, and of those who have lost their homes and livelihood, are the objects of our profound solicitude. The hardships and sufferings to which our nation is to be subjected hereafter will be certainly great. We are keenly aware of the inmost feelings of all of you, our subjects. However, it is according to the dictates of time and fate that we have resolved to pave the way for the grand peace for all the generations to come by enduring the unendurable and suffering what is insufferable. Having been able to safeguard and maintain the Kokutai, we are always with you our good and loyal subjects, relying upon your sincerity and integrity. Beware most strictly of any outbursts of emotion which may engender needless complications, or any fraternal contention and strife which may create confusion, lead you astray, and cause you to lose the confidence of the world. Let the entire nation continue as one family from generation to generation, ever firm in its faith in the imperishability of its sacred land, and mindful of its heavy burden of responsibility, and of the long road before it. Unite your total strength to be devoted to construction for the future. Cultivate the ways of rectitude, foster nobility of spirit, and work with resolution, so that you may enhance the innate glory of the imperial state, and keep pace with the progress of the world.